Welcome, everybody, to the Hawaii Film Critics Society annual um, Best of Series that we do every single year. So glad to have you guys here. So glad to be here. Uh, I tell you, I couldn't get a phone call at a worse time, but that's okay. We're here, ladies and gentlemen, talking about the best films of 2022. Of course, brought to you by us, the good people. The good reviewers, the good critics at the Hawaii Film Critics Society. Ladies and gentlemen, let me uh, welcome my two fellow compatriots that are also here. And the uh, founder, first of all, the founder and president of the Hawaii Film Critics Society. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Barry Worst in the house. Barry, good, doing well, I hope. Also, uh, ladies and gentlemen, give everybody give a golf clap to this man. Aaron Maderos, one of our top reviewers and critics in Hawaii Film Critics Society. Well, boys and girls, uh, so glad you can make it on this 2022. We made it through another year. Thank goodness. But now it is time uh, to do a wrap up of what was 2022 um, as far as the uh, as far as movies go. Um, first off, we have to send a huge, huge congratulations um, to someone who happens to be the man who basically restored movies to their, uh, to their greatness. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise. Yeah. Yes, Tom Cruise, bringing back the movies. I thought they were dead. I'm going to say it again. I was so glad to be wrong. But Tom Cruise has uh, brought us back from the edge. And uh, movies are back in business. Well, a little somewhat. Uh, I'm not going to name names, but there are uh, a few movie companies that have uh, decided to file for bankruptcy. But uh, yeah, uh, it's unfortunate. But hopefully we're, we're, we're turning a corner as far as movies go. Uh, so congratulations, of course, to Top Gun Maverick, which, which, which is responsible for the resurrection of movie theaters. Uh, bar none. I mean, that is, that, is, that, is not, that is not hyperbole. That is what happened. Uh, so, um, before we get started, thoughts on, uh, uh, on what top top gun did this year. Take it away, Aaron. Ah, uh, how else can you say it's remarkable. It after is remarkable. 30, you know, after 35 years, people embrace the movie and, and shockingly, it's very, very good. Shockingly, yeah. you, you, well, I mean, you, because, that's not well, even fair. Just because of the time the span. All right. No, I had my doubts because the time span is so long. Tony Scott's not involved. You know, so. Okay, that's fair. But fantastic. Fantastic. Oh, very good. Uh, Barry, as a film critic yourself uh, and, a, and a man who's been around the business for a long time, uh, coming out of the hole that we were in from 2020 to 2021, were you surprised at the turnaround with just one movie? Well, first of all, I'm glad that we gave a round of applause to Tom Cruise because he never gets his due. He's highly underrated. Never does. And all never serious, does. I mean, we're all big fans. We've, we've spoken about this many times, what a fan we are of Tom Cruise. Sure. Um, no, I mean, you know, I, I love that he is for my generation what John Wayne was for my father's generation. I mean, like this is yeah. – he's not just a movie star. He's kind of the ultimate movie star. He's one of the most sure. iconic of all time. Um Top Gun Maverick is, is, is just such a great experience on the big screen. I'm really glad that he held out and said, no, 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 I don't want this Paramount Plus thing. I want it in theaters where people need to see it. He was absolutely right to hold off. I, mean, I was, I was very was upset about that years. first decision. And I was very upset about that decision in 2020 when we got locked out. I said, boy, it would be great to have Top Gun at home to watch. And I have to, I hate to admit the fact that he was absolutely right. That movie is something everybody was waiting for. And he... He called the ball on that. I mean, he told he told Paramount, "Listen, uh, I'm not releasing this movie." So you know, they did what he did, and they made. And I guarantee you, they made a lot more money than they were expecting. And he's smart. He held on to it. I mean, he saw what happened to movies like Tenet, for example, which probably yes. in a in a usual summer that movie probably, even though you know, I know it's a divisive film to bring up out of nowhere, but like that's a film that I think probably would have made somewhere between 150 to 200 million in a regular summer. But because it was put out there, same thing with Bill and Ted face the music, it was put out there in kind of a wasteland. 
And, you know, people who wanted to see those movies saw them later. They didn't really see them in theaters. So right. I love that, you know, Cruz decided to hold on to it, um, waited until, I mean, it was two years late. And even though most of us had already seen the trailer so many times, even, yeah. I mean, it, it connected even more than the James Bond movie, which was also delayed for two years. So, yeah, what a, which, what a nice surprise. That, that it's is, so funny. That you mentioned, it's a great film. I, it's, it's funny that you mentioned um, Tenet, because remember when Tenet came out, Tenet was the one that said that we were going back to the movies. Remember that? That was the movie that got that. That was the movie that Christopher Nolan waited for and said, this is the movie that's going to get us back to the theaters, which it not necessarily did. For some reason, I think people were still under precaution and what have you. But yeah, that was the movie that did come out in theaters and didn't fare very well. And I think I do think it does get a lot of uh, uh, a lot of flack. You know, it's not great, but I thought it was pretty good. Bennett, you know, it gets a lot of flack. Barry's not a fan. Uh, no, it was my favorite movie in 2020. <laughs> oh, was it? Was I lo- it? I love okay. that film. Okay, okay. Um, I think I think the appreciation appreciation rather of that movie will build over time. But I mean, it it is it, it's strangely enough like a Christopher Nolan cult film. A lot of people did not see it when they had the chance to. That's right. Um, I think people will catch up with it. Maybe when Open Oppenheimer comes out, people will. I was just about to say Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer's trailer was fantastic. I am yeah, very excited incredible. for Oppenheimer. Well, listen, gentlemen. Um, uh, we of course are. Uh, uh, we are also not accompanied tonight by other esteemed colleagues of ours that are part of the Hawaii Film Critics Society. Uh, Professor Barry, uh, you can check out all of their. Um, uh, all of their reviews at uh, the High Film Critics Society dot org. That's High Film Critics Society dot org. Uh, who would you uh, who, uh, could you uh, recognize them, uh, Professor Barry, that we have sure. uh, in the Hawaii Film Critics Society? There's Gary Kogo who writes for West Hawaii. That's uh, he's on the Big Island. Uh, let's see. There's Myung Choi who writes on Oahu. Okay. There, of course, is Terry Hunter who writes for Hawaii News Now. There is uh, Jaron Abegnawag, who writes uh, for his, his special YouTube page now on Maui. And let's see, who am I forgetting? Rick Chattanever, of course. Uh, Rick Chattanever, who writes for Adventures in Words, formerly of uh, the Maui News. I think I got everybody. Yeah, is that Shuri, everybody? Course, who has his own uh, his own page. He used to write for Fawak Hawaii, but now he writes uh, for – he's got his own YouTube page, which is very popular. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, uh, uh, Jason David. Thank you, Jason David. Boy, am I sorry. I boy, I regret forgetting that one. Yes, Jason David, who is also like yourself, a member of the Nerd Watch, and you both uh, have written for, and also you uh, do the Nerd Watch podcast. So. That that is correct. Um, but uh, I just want to recognize that. Uh, listen, there 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 are no better than's in the Hawaii Film Critics Society. Everybody's on equal ground here. But right now, you're looking at the best of Hawaii Film Critics Society. Uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, okay. So just be be aware of that. Um, but I'm not trying to I'm not trying to you know divide or you know or or diminish. That's not my that's not my place. I'm just saying that you're looking at the best. Um, but you're looking at the ones who would show up. Yes. <laughs> uh, hence the best. Well, listen. Here's the thing. Um, 2022 was uh surprisingly um as far as movies go it seemed as if you know 2021 we were still in a in a very interesting situation where people were still kind of afraid to go out didn't go out much at all we were still under restrictions and lockdowns 2022 felt like an actual movie year um for at least at least for the last two years right maybe even maybe two and a half so 2022 felt a lot like a uh, like an official back to the movie year, um, and of course tonight we're or today we're going to um, recognize some of the best and some of the disappointments of the year. Um, overall, uh, if we uh, Aaron and Barry, uh, if you were to rate 2022 as a movie year, uh, was was this a banner year for film? I would say it was a really strong year. Sorry to interrupt you. Here. No, no. I'll, I'll jump off. I'll, I'll be very quick. I, I feel like it was a good year because there were so many good strange movies, so many off kind of off the cuff movies. I love that right now, everybody's talking about, you know, the box office of Avatar, but everyone's also celebrating the fact that the menu found an audience. I'm a big fan of that film. And right. it's one of those films like everything everywhere all at once. Uh, like a few a 24 and neon films that managed to find an audience, despite the fact that, 
you know, spectacle and sequels and remakes and franchise tentpole films and comic book movies are really the biggest thing right now. So I love it that little films are finding an audience and audiences are flocking to these movies. It's not quite at, you know, it's not like when it was at its peak. But people are starting to get adventurous with their film tastes, and the movies were very adventurous and very interesting this year. Aaron, hey, what about you, sir? I would say, like, this year had a lot of divisive movies. A lot oh. of movies people, you know. Um, but also, as Barry said, there's a lot of sh- weird, strange things that came out that people, you know, embraced, which is nice. Yeah. But I, I think this year is a lot better because every movie I've been to in the theater has been packed. Like, Nothing has been kind of, you know, just little audience. You know, it's 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 all been full. So, I think it's it's officially back. You know what's interesting to me, and you know, I don't want to go on too much of a a tangent because we're trying to focus on the films. But, you know, after two thousand and twenty, two thousand nineteen, I thought, <clears throat> and I, I think I expressed this to you, Barry, at the time that. <clears throat> You know, we our last film experience, as far as an experience, was going to be um, the uh, the Rise of Skywalker, Star yeah. Wars, right? I mentioned to you that was going to be the last of the of the big films where everybody kind of got together and rallied around it. And I think that even though it may have been a banner year for movies in 2022, I feel that we haven't really hit what we did in 2000. And, and by the way. The Rise of Skywalker was a huge disappointment, Um, but that's for another show. But we haven't had a movie, and I I guess I have to give it time. We haven't had a movie that we, as uh, as a as a as as a human race, have rallied around. We haven't had, and I and I we haven't had another movie like Avengers Endgame, and how you know how those movie theaters were packed with people. Those movie theaters, everybody's rallying around those movies. It, 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 the, the, the reaction videos on YouTube are just tremendous. Everybody having such a good time. We haven't had that for three and I don't even, for three years because I don't even think 2022 had a film like that where everybody kind of... Huh? Top Gun? And, well, well, what I'm, I guess what I'm saying is, is that... No, I, I'm with you on that. But what I'm saying is, is that I, I don't... Top Gun is for people like us right as in um it was it got a younger group in but it was it was definitely for uh an audience that have seen the original right but so what i'm saying is that we've never we haven't had that movie that has really rallied us together as an as an audience and as a film going audience like avengers endgame that really pushed has pushed us to the theater Uh, but then again in my estimation, maybe I'm wrong because maybe the fact is, is that now the movie going experience has changed, right? I mean, <clears throat> we go to movie theaters now and it's more than half the seats are missing from the movie theaters. We don't stand in line for tickets anymore. We're always buying our tickets online or what have you. So the experience has definitely changed. There's not, you know, no, you know, for as much as we hated lines going into the movies, there was something special about standing in line at the movie theater and making conversation with the people that you don't even know, but you but you can look at those people in line and know they are with you. You know what I'm saying? Like you could say that you know those those are my people, and like you, you can tell by the shirts that they're wearing or the or the comic books or books that they're reading, and you strike up conversations, you make friendships, you make new friendships. You know what I mean? But it seems like movie going. Being, going to the movies in 2022 or in the 21st century has really changed. And I, when I go to, a, you know, going to Avatar 2 should have been a big deal, right? I mean, but it just, it felt just like any other movie to me. You know, even going to Top Gun felt like any other movie for me. So, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm just, once again, I'm a, I guess the older I get, the more cynical I become. The more I become the glasses half empty kind of guy. But yeah, I just feel like even though movies are good, I just don't feel like we rally around the movies like we used to. And maybe that's because people have other interests or, you know, they're not. I don't know. I felt like 2019 was it felt like at least right now, at least for me right now, it feels like 2019 was kind of the end of a very special era. So I don't know. 
Maybe I could. Maybe, maybe I could be. Maybe it wasn't the death of movie theaters. Maybe it was the death of the movie going experience. So I don't know. But you, listen, I don't mean to put a damper on what we're doing here today. I'm just, I was just making a, an observation of I've been to the movies quite a bit in 2022, and I never felt like anybody was having, a, you know, having the greatest of times. If you catch my drift, so. Even though All right, well, I'll, I'll counter that with a little bit of optimism because people please, were screaming and please. losing their minds at Top Gun yeah. Maverick. And by the right. way, maybe you've had this problem. I realize, like you like yourself, I'm definitely getting older. People keep telling me how their favorite movie that they saw this year is Maverick. And I keep thinking, you just saw that this year? You know, that came out in 1994, right? And I realize, you know, like, oh, yeah, they're not talking about the Mel Gibson Western. They're Correct. Talking about- Top Gun Maverick. Maverick, so. Maverick is fantastic. That, that, I wish that, you youngsters would say Top Gun 2 or Top Gun and not just say yeah. Maverick because then I'm thinking of yeah. like, oh, like really? You just saw that film? It's an old movie. Anyway. Yeah. But yeah, everybody I know who saw that film had this really wonderful experience in the theater. Um, I'm, I'm with you. I didn't have the greatest time watching Avatar, The Way of Water. But you know what? I know, I know a lot of people who are having that experience. And I didn't see it in IMAX 3D. Apparently, that's, that's a really transportive experience. Um, I, a friend of mine was telling me he went and saw I Want to Dance with Somebody the other night, and he said the people were singing along and cheering in the theater. So, you know, I'm not always seeing it kind of like yourself. I'm not always having those experiences. One thing is that I, I catch shows late or I catch matinees. I sure. typically don't go when the prime audience is, is there. So I know I'm missing something. Uh, but at the same time, I am hearing that the experience is coming back for people. I do wonder, for example, what next year is going to be like with the new Mission Impossible, the new Indiana Jones, the new Magic Mike. You know, these experiences where audiences are famously very vocal while the movies are going on. Um, I did not get to see Wakanda Forever in the big screen, but I saw it. I watched it at home and I was so moved by it. I wonder if it was a really I wonder if it was as powerful for audiences as it was for me. Two things. Number one, uh, the fact that you mentioned Magic Mike and Indiana Jones in the same sentence uh, should strike you from ever reviewing another movie for Hawaiian Film Critics Society. Number one. Number two, let me know who the people that were really enjoying Avatar 2. Uh, give me their names because I they may, they may need to be checked. Easy. Um, James Cameron yeah. and Sigourney <laughs> Weaver. <laughs> big fans. Anyway, let's... Uh, Let's get into some, uh, we're going to talk about some of the biggest disappointments of 2022 because I'm that guy, but we're going to start off with the best of 2022 in no particular order. Uh, now, uh, we'll name off a few movies. Uh, we'll name off our, t- our, our, what we'll do is, is that maybe we'll go round robin. Okay. And we'll kind of explain. So I'll start Barry, then Aaron, and then we'll do it again. So uh, as of now, in no particular order, uh, one of my one of, uh, I will start with this. one of the top films of 2022 for me is The Menu. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned it earlier. Uh, I thought The Menu was fantastic. Uh, I thought it. Uh, I thought for the life of me that I was not expecting what I got, and it was it, it was a film that uh, was not only sumptuous visually but uh in story as well and i really i was really enraptured by what they gave us on screen what about you barry my well i'll, I'll do i'll do a top 10 and i'll start with 10 in my list then uh and and i'll i'll kind of counter you i love the menu i did but my favorite ensemble murder mystery movie of the year was kenneth Branagh's death on the nile I really love that film. That was another movie that was delayed for a long time. It didn't yeah. seem like it had much of a commercial chance. And obviously Disney was very nervous about it because one of the actors in it. Um, I thought it was a better film than Murder on the Orient Express. I thought it was Kenneth Branagh at the top of his powers because not only did it have that theatricality we expect from his work, but I thought the filmmaking, the, the performances, the music, the cinematography, everything about the movie was muscular. I think it's a really strong film. I hope he continues with the franchise. I know the last one didn't do that well, but I, I really loved the film. I thought it was a real sleeper. Do you honestly think that 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 Army Hammer was a distraction for that film, and that's why it wasn't as, as successful? I, I don't think so. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think that could be blamed on why the film underperformed, but, I mean, I, I'm sure there are people who are, you know, no longer associating him with the Lone Ranger. No, that, I mean, that. by the way, Lone Ranger is... Uh, uh, an underrated movie that I actually really enjoyed. Um, but, you know, I think Army Hammer would probably be, should have been cast in Mark Rylance's role in Bones and All. But I'll leave that to the critics. 
Polly um, Shore should have been cast in that role. Anybody should have been cast in that role. I see. Polly Shore is here on the lovely island of Maui, and I saw him. Um, he, uh, interesting cat. And boy, he's, uh, yeah. Anyway, what a name uh, drop, Polly Shore. Yeah. <laughs> so I like the menu. Um, uh, I think I think, and then uh, you enjoyed um, Death uh, Death on the yeah. Nile. Yep. Uh, I was with the funny thing you mentioned Death on the Nile. I was watching the Peter Ustinov, and that was, by the way, that's great. That Peter Ustinov Death on the Nile was fantastic. Anyway, uh, Aaron, what about you? What was one of your favorites this year? <clears throat> well, first, both great choices. Fantastic. Um, <clears throat> but my number ten, it has to do with the movie making. It's it's one of the movies that this year had this year had a lot of movies about movie making. Um, it's it's ten, but it's still I think the best about it, which is the Spanish movie Official Competition with Antonio Banderas, Penelope right. Cruz, and Oscar Martinez. It is so funny. Um, I got I got it I uh. I I have it. I haven't had a, a, a chance to see it yet. I got. I cannot James wait because I was very. I was very yeah. excited for that. After I saw what it was about and who was in it, I was very excited. So it's good. It's very funny. Okay. Antonio, okay. Antonio Banderas has not been this good in a while. I don't know. Uh, did you see but, Puss in Boots: The Last Wish? There you go. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Barry, did you see official competition? No, but I've got four days left in the year, and I'm planning on seeing it. It's you know, I'm I'm racing the clock to to finalize my list and to see everything. I've heard it's great. Aaron was the first one I know who loved it, and I really want to see it. All right, next on my list of films uh, that I thoroughly enjoyed this year, um, I don't know if anybody has seen it, but uh, the Triangle of Sadness, Triangle of Sadness. Um, I, you know, here's the thing. I don't want to tell anybody about this. You just need to see it. Uh, Woody Harrelson plays a boat captain for uh, uh, on a for for uh, he's a boat. He's the he's the captain of a boat that is for a bunch of elitist douchebags. In some respects, if you have not seen it, it's very funny. It's it's very it's very good. Uh highly recommend it. I don't want to tell you much more than that. Look it up. The Triangle of Sadness. Um, excellent film. Did you guys get to see it? No? I ha- I, I haven't even seen the trailer. Oh wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I saw it. I I think it peaked on the boat, honestly. Yeah. I'm no, not it a did. Fan of the third act at all. Um Interesting film, memorable, disgusting. Uh, yes. Yeah, I agree with you. The less you know about it, the better. Yes. I think it had some major pacing problems. I don't think the film needed to be as long as it is, and I think the beginning, the setup is a little too long. There's some That's good fair. stuff. I That's think fair. his best film is still Force Majeure, but yeah, it, it's memorable. I'll never forget Triangle Sadness, no question. Correct. That, and that, I think that's what it kind of stuck with me. I think that's why it's not at the best. It's not on the top of my list, but it's it's definitely up there for sure. Uh, Barry, what about you? Next, another film that's on your on your list there. My number nine is a documentary by Bianca Stigter. It's called Three Minutes a Lengthening. It's about oh it's, yeah yeah it's it's remarkable. It's about this footage that has somehow surfaced of this town in Poland from 1938. Right. And the film is just, it's just this footage over and over again. You never, it, even though it's narrated by Helena Bonham Carter, you never see anything outside of the footage. You're seeing the footage right. over and over again. And the first time you're seeing it without any sound. So it's very like, what is this? Has the film started? But as the film progresses, they show the film over and over again. It gets more and more hypnotic. And the narration explains that this is footage that has been lost. This is a town that has been lost. This is a town that uh, uh, suffered the the horrors of fascism and and the Nazis uh, uh, occupying and eventually uh, killing basically everyone in the town. It is horrifying. Um, But it's a fascinating documentary. And just by using the footage, the filmmakers were able to to obtain information about family history, uh, uh, social history. It's a, it's a it's a great film about filmmaking. As 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 Aaron has pointed out, there's a lot of great movies about filmmaking this year, and this is one of them. Um, I was enraptured by it. it was I I yeah. Um, there's not much I can say other than the fact that uh, if you are someone who enjoys documentaries, watch it. I I was I was not expecting what I got. Can is that would that be? 
Would that be an, uh, an accurate statement? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, yeah. It, yeah, it's, it's wonderful. It's a, yeah. it's a great mystery of all things. Yeah. 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 Hey, Ron, what about you? Another movie on your list there, sir. Uh, did you watch three minutes of lengthening? I did not. Okay. Is that uh, on a streaming service or just? No, we, I, it's not we got out that, yet. didn't we? Um, yeah, that I, was a, it was a, it's a neon release. Yeah, it was neon. a neon release. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I we'll have look for there. that. Yeah, you should, you should have it. All right. Uh, my number nine is probably one we can pass because I know you both don't like it. <laughs> yes, but it what was, is it? it? It was light year. <laughs> you are correct. You, you are correct. Like That's on my worst of list. That's a, uh, pre- a little preview of the worst movies of the year. Light year for me. <laughs> well, Aaron, why did you like it? Tell us. Yes, Convince why did us. you like it? It, it literally made, made me feel like a little kid. Like I was smiling the whole movie. I was so excited by these action scenes. And I went with my sister and she, the whole movie, she, I caught her looking at me. And when the movie was done, she's like, I've never seen you that happy <laughs> coming out of a movie in a long time. Yeah. I don't know. It I, just made me feel like a kid. Made me want to go buy a Buzz Lightyear toy. And watching the movie, it re- being a hardcore fan, it reminded me of a Ridley Scott sci-fi movie for kids. Like the color tone and the cinematography and all that. It felt like a Ridley Scott sci-fi for kids. But I don't know. I just had fun with the whole thing. And That's interesting. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't get the same feeling as you did, but I did feel like a kid. I mean, I I, I actually felt like, uh, I mean, does it count if you are uh, if you are curled up like a baby on the floor after you watch that film in the fetal position? Is that does that count? Um, yeah, not not a fan. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, moving on to another uh, another one of our best of on our uh, one of our best of films of the year best of list. Um, um, Aaron, this one's for you, um, and that's only because Ooh. you gave us Lightyear. Um, one of the best films of the year, without oh, a doubt. No, don't say it. Don't is say the it. Fablemans. Ah, the 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 Fablemans uh, for me was not only one of the best films of the year. I think it's one of Steven Spielberg's better films in the in the respect of it being a smaller, uh, story driven film. It wasn't. Visually spectacular, I thought the movie tonally and story was just tremendous. Uh, there were a few missteps, but I have to say that the Fable was, was just spot on for me this year. Loved it. Absolutely loved it. Barry, what did you think? It's one of the few recent Steven Spielberg films that I'll see again. I don't care about The Terminal or War Horse or the, right. or was it The Post. There's a lot of films. He's a done Bridge of Spies. Like, I admire some of the movies hey, he's made hey. recently, but I just don't care about them. This is one of the few I will see again. I'm kind of in the middle of you two. I didn't hate it. I'm not madly in love with it. I'm kind of right here because I agree with you. I think there are some missteps. I think the final scene in the movie is one of the most delightful things I've seen all year. What a wonderful It was idea. great. To have one of the greatest living directors play one of our greatest living directors. I thought that was such a wonderful Did you touch. see? Listen, I'm not giving anything away when I say this. Did you? And if I do, spoiler alert, just in case. One of my favorite scenes in that film is the ending, when one of the when 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 we see um, Steven Spielberg or as or, or or young Fableman go in and visit um, uh, Miss John Ford, right? Yeah. Okay, and he and what we find out about him, you know, the uh, uh, your picture is only interesting if if your horizon is the top or at the bottom. And I love the fact that the end of that film, I don't know if you noticed it, but Steven Spielberg made a fantastic choice and he put the horizon in the middle. Did you notice? I thought that was. I did notice that. Yeah, the camera quick did it. Yeah. No, it's a wonderful touch. It is. Just, oh man, I was like, you got me. I was like, that was so great. And I was like, I was like, that is, that it was such a movie thing for him to do. And I felt like, you feel a little joyous after you see it. It's like, is it's interesting how that how he made that interesting. I thought that was great. I, I really did. So when the film uh, is dealing with yeah, when the film is dealing with the love, the joy of film, and when it's yes. a focus on his mother, I think the film is really good. Yes, there's so I think I don't know that the high school subplot really connects. There's so it much was that weird. Movie- there's it so was much weird. of that film that felt like a movie and not real. You know, Spielberg, yes. you know, 
he is a great cinema artist. He's a great visualist. So I think like doing reality, it's kind of a stretch for him. Outside of Schindler's List, you know, he doesn't do like hardcore reality very well. So inevitably, it does like the whole thing feels kind of like the movie always. Even the small, mo- mo- even the small moments feel like big set pieces for him. Yes. Um, yeah. So I'm I'm kind of in the middle about it, but I did like it. And as I said, I'm I'm gonna revisit it again. There's there's great stuff in it. There is absolutely great stuff in it. I am a huge fan of the Fablemans. I really like the story about the the Fablemans themselves. It was small enough that it, and I you know I don't know if you noticed it. For me, it was one of those films where it wasn't about Hollywood and those movies. It was just about the love of making them. Yeah, that's what I liked. That was different. It wasn't. It wasn't Hollywood or Steven Spielberg trying to say how wonderful Hollywood is because I hate those movies because you get them every year. This was different, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Absolutely, Aaron, you loved it too, didn't you? Oh, no. <laughs> Barry, what was another film I'm just on your list? There, that Barry doesn't like the Terminal. No, he didn't say he didn't like the Terminal. Well, I mean, he said he wouldn't revisit it. Yeah, yeah, I'm not a so, fan of the terminal. No, no, no. The the terminal for me is like Ready Player One. I there are things about it that are good, but I don't think it's a great movie. And the terminal um, was was great up until it decided up the, up until it decided it didn't want to be a fairy tale anymore. And that's why I, I thought it sucked. It has tonal problems. I agree. It wants to be a post 9-11 film about air travel, but it also wants to be this fairy tale. And I don't think yeah. the movie knows what it is. And I right. Spielberg's it's not Spielberg's fault that I have this animosity towards the movie. But Spielberg did say in an interview, he said, this is Tom Hanks's greatest performance. And I, I disagree with him. <laughs> I think that I do is too. completely inaccurate. It's completely yeah. inaccurate. Barry, what about you? What's on your list? Uh, uh, David L. Cunningham's The Wind and the Reckoning. This I did is- not see that. I love this movie. It's still playing in limited release. Of course, this is a film that won Best Picture at the Boston Film Festival, which is amazing. Uh, there are a lot of films that are made locally. This is one of the one of the most landmark examples of that. Everything about this movie, the passion, the skill in which it was made, the lead performance uh, from Jason Scott Lee on down. This is a movie that deals, gosh, I mean, it deals with uh, the oppression of indigenous people. It deals with the, uh, the, the leper colony. This deals with, uh, gosh, the overcome, the overthrow, rather, of the, of the kingdom. There's so much going on with this movie historically. None of that would matter if the film wasn't entertaining, entertaining and done with skill. And it is. Uh, this is, it's such a great film. You know, when these movies come out, when, you know, locally made independent movies, you know, of course, I want to get behind them and support them. And sometimes like, oh, sometimes like there's like something about it that that's not perfect. This film is fantastic. Um, If I didn't live on Maui, if I lived in Sheboygan and I saw this movie, I would still be in love with it. It's a great movie. It's a mixture of 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 Hawaiian history presented through the form of a Western. It's wonderful. What's really sad. And I and this is and this is just a this is a critique of how they dole out these films at film festivals. A movie like The Wind and the Reckoning, which looks incredible, which I cannot wait to see. Um, It's sad that when a film that is so. connected to the story itself is connected to Hawaii in such a way, but it never seems to get the love here on a local level in the fact that in, in effect, or I should say in the effect of that, it never seems that theaters really respond to it or get them here. Or I, I don't know what the deal is. I don't know why it happens the way it does, but we, you know, that, that should have been playing here already. You know what I mean? That that wouldn't you think so? Or are they waiting till the Hawaii uh, the Hawaii International it's here, Film it's Festival? It's, it's, it's been playing at the Queen Kahumana Center for uh, uh, oh. uh, a couple of weeks now. I think going right. on a month. So it was it's only it's, supposed it's, to be a one week thing. Yeah, and it oh, keeps okay. getting pushed back. So I yeah. think it's I think it is finding its audience out here at least. It's it had a limited release on Oahu, and I know it's some of the other theaters have been kind of doling it out. You know, it's competing against Avatar and and Wakanda Forever fair, and all these are the bigger films. You know that that's you know, and sometimes these movies connect. I mean, you know, The Woman King was a film that managed to really find an audience, even though it was competing against a lot of other films. You know, and sometimes you have these movies that just kind of go away. This this one's yeah. sticking around. I hope whether it's through streaming or just what whatever it takes for people sure. to find it, um, but it, it needs to be seen. It's excellent. Hey, Ron, what about you, sir? What's your next film on your uh, list? There? My, my number eight was uh, this one. I wish I saw in theaters. I regret it. But it's uh, Robert Eggers, The Northman. You regret seeing it in the theater? Yeah, I never, I didn't see it in the theater. Oh, you oh, didn't? Okay. Oh, I saw it gotcha. Streaming. Okay. Right, so I regret not seeing it in theaters, but man, what a movie. 
Um, ironically enough, that film is actually on my list, and I got to tell you something. I could not agree with you more. It is. It was a film that I was not expecting. I thought it was going. I didn't realize even after watching Robert Eggers' films like The Lighthouse and The Witch, I really thought that he was going to go for something different from the way he usually makes it. I thought it was going to be a little more action oriented. I really thought it was, he was going to be pushing the boundaries of say um, violence and things like that. It wasn't that like at all. Yeah. This really, you're right. Aaron, this, th- that the Northman really digs deep into Scandinavian lore. And it really digs into the, I, what my, my enjoyment came out of the fact that it digs deep into the ritual and into the, um, uh, into the spirituality of the Scandinavian people. Um, I, cause I don't want to just say Vikings cause you know, obviously that's what this is about, but you're right. I thought that it was fa- fantastic. Anya Taylor joy. Who's in it. She's also in the menu. And of course the son of Stellan Skarsgård is in it. Um, Alexander, is it Alexander? Alexander, Alexander isn't it? Alexander. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the Northman, I would definitely, that that's definitely on my list. Uh, what do you, uh, what do you think of that Barry? You like I really liked it a lot. It reminded me a lot of one of my favorite films from last year, The Green Knight. It's not, as you said, it's not so much an action movie as it is right. a film about classical storytelling. And it's correct. It, it's it's like reading Arthurian lore or you know or, or Greek mythology and having it come to life. The performances are wonderful. I was wondering throughout the entire film, like, why is Nicole Kidman even in this? She's not even used well. You get to the third act and you go, Oh I man, see- like, I didn't didn't see that coming. Yeah, didn't yeah, see that coming that- at all. Didn't Great see that coming at all. Yeah. Good, it, it good did pick, not make my top ten list, but I really enjoyed that film. I appreciate you bringing it up. It came out early in the year, and it's one it's one of those films that should not be overlooked. I agree. Absolutely, the Northman. Great pick, Aaron. Uh, I take back everything I said about you. Oh. Um, also on my list of films, um, uh, I'm this has gotten a lot of play now, considering that is currently on HBO Max. The Banshees of Inisherin. Um. If you haven't seen it, Colin Farrell, um, Brendan Gleeson, um, um, the director, Martin McDonough, the man who did In Bruges. Um, and I believe he did. Did he do Seven Psychopaths? I believe he did. Seven Psychopaths, yeah. Three Billboards. Three, three Billboards, uh, yeah, in, in Ebbings, Missouri, or what have you. Um, once again, this movie is its strength is in its performances. Um, Colin Farrell and Brendan Gleeson will blow you away. They're just phenomenal. And what what's so interesting is that watching it where it was having the movie being um filmed on the Irish coast is it's beautiful. And the films the it every you should see it. It's currently on HBO Max now. If you have not seen it, take a look at it. You will be in, uh, you will be enamored with how good it is the story i thought was good the performances are just incredible and it's just i don't think you know the trailer doesn't necessarily do it justice in the fact that you know you the, the trailer makes it seem like brendan gleason just isn't talking to colin farrell and it almost seems like it's comedic but it's much bigger than that and that is where I think it re- the strength is in this film. So, uh, Ban- the Banshees of Inisherin, uh, big thumbs up for me on my on my top ten list this year for sure. What do you guys think? I give it this many fingers. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a spoiler. Yeah, yeah spoiler. Uh, Barry, uh, another film on your list there, sir. Uh, Alex Garland's Men, which is one of the most insane summer movie releases. I know this is A24, but even though this is the company that released Midsommar and Lamb, they really outdid themselves putting this thing in a theater. Um, I love this film. It's absolutely insane. The performances by Rory Kinnear and Jesse Buckley I thought were fantastic. It has a lot in its mind. I don't know that if everything really comes into focus. The film is more dreamlike than it is you know, coherent. Nevertheless, uh, I found it to be repulsive and unsettling and consistently surprising. I love the risk that it takes. This is horror filmmaking at its most bold. And it, as, as Aaron said, yes, this is a year of divisive films. This is one of the big ones, and I love this movie. This movie for me wouldn't I didn't I didn't love it as much as you did, but I will say that without Rory Kinnear, I don't think this movie would have been as good as it was. Hmm. Do you, because he is so good at being a creep 
Am I, am I, am I, you, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, like six different iterations of a creep. Yeah, right, definitely. right. So without Rory Kinnear, I don't think this movie would have shined as much as it did. I don't know why Alex Garland is, you know, it, you know, in some circles, you would assume that there would be a lot of women offended about, I mean, in 2022, considering about a man telling this very feminist story, right? But it didn't seem to get that kind of backlash. I don't know if it's because a lot of people didn't see it or what, but I'm with you. I, I thought man was not on my best of list, but definitely worth a watch for sure. Aaron, did you get to see it? I have not. Oh, okay. Well, then don't talk about it. Aaron, what about you? What's on your list? Uh, let's see. My number seven, uh, it's a limited series on Hulu, but I watched it straight through all six hours in one sitting because it was that good. So I don't know. I put it as one of my best, but it's the new Danny Boyle uh, pistol about the sex pistols. Hang on a second. That was not in the movie theaters. How dare you? It still comes. Well, we'll, we'll put it as a, as a, as a, as a, uh, as an honorable mention. I didn't get to it's see the tricky record. though. Isn't it guys? Ever it's since tricky. the pandemic started, it's been tricky because we have yeah. these films that played at film festivals. So therefore they had a theatrical yeah. release. Some of them you know, should have had theatrical releases, but they went straight to streaming. I mean, like, you know, two of the most watched films this year were two sequels, Hocus Pocus 2 and Disenchanted. Neither had a theatrical release, but everyone who wanted to watch that movie has seen it. Same thing with Glass Onion. Didn't really have much of a theatrical release, although it yeah. did at one point. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's a weird area, isn't it? Because on the one hand, my rule of thumb is that like, hey, if this if this, as long as it played on a screen, as long as it played in some film festival somewhere that sure. counts as a theatrical release – but it is tricky, right? Because in some cases, they're like, look, we're just going to release it on whatever, Netflix, HBO Max. We don't even care if the thing is in theaters. But it matters because you want, as, as we've all been talking about, you want that audience response. You want to know what people initially thought of. And if we're going to talk about, if we're going to tout the theatrical experience, we want the theatrical experience. Right. That's a good point. Um, uh, it's on It's on Hulu right now. I haven't got to see, uh, I haven't got to see all of it, but uh Aaron is correct. It is very, very good. Speaking of, speaking of artists um, and speaking of music, I will actually go with a film that was actually in theaters this year as one of the best films of the year. Elvis with Austin Butler and Tom Hanks, um, directed by Baz Luhrmann. Elvis was a phenomenal piece of filmmaking. Uh, not only that, Austin Butler was incredible. Tom Hanks was good, but not one of his best performances by any stretch. Um, but Elvis and Baz Luhrmann's direction, because I tell you what, the first half of the movie is like, I was like, is that felt the first half of the film feels like a Baz Luhrmann movie. Then the second half of the film feels like something completely different. And I got to tell you something. It was incredible to behold. I've watched that film a couple of times after it, uh, after its initial release and i am still enamored with how good it is and uh highly highly recommend and on my uh, on the top of at least on the top of my list of films this year is elvis with austin butler um you guys have the same feeling was it on your best of as well or no what about you no, Aaron? no it's not as good as pistol Psh. but uh <laughs> As far as theatrical music biopics go, yes, Elvis was the best one this year. Yeah, um, yeah, it's, it's really one that you should have has to be seen in the in theaters with the strong song, all that. Is it better than the Weird Al movie? Oh, that's a tough oh. one, man. Oh man, that's different. That, but that, I tell you what, that Weird Al movie, even though we can't count it, that Weird Al movie is much better than anyone gives it credit for. You can count that. It played in film festivals. We can count. Oh, it. that's right. It did. It did it play did. in film yeah, festivals. I yeah. didn't put it on there. I didn't realize. I forgot that it played in film festivals. That's right. Yeah, we're talking about Weird, the Al Yankovic story. Yeah, yeah, yeah the one with Daniel Ratcliffe. Um, did you did you did you like Elvis? Uh, you froze there, Barry. So I didn't get to. See, did, what did you say? Uh, I think it picks up in the second half a lot. I really like yes. the second half, the Vegas years. Um, I really enjoy that part of the movie a lot. I agree with you, Austin. Uh, Austin, I almost said Austin Butler. Howard. 
Thank you. Austin <laughs> Butler. He's wonderful. He's terrific. Um, and I'm looking forward to him in Dune as well. Uh, not a fan of the, of the Tom Hanks contribution to that film. I found it very distracting. You know, I grew up with Hanks just like you all did. Sometimes he could be the best thing in a bad movie. In this, in this case, it felt like the opposite. I felt like he was the worst thing in a best movie in a good movie. Yeah. I, I, I yeah. I, you know, I, I don't know what happened here. I don't I don't know if it was just simply miscasting or, or if it just the if it was just too demonstrative of a performance, but I couldn't forget sure. who I was watching. I was constantly watching one of my favorite actors covered in latex with a bizarre accent. And look, I get it. I know that's part of the character. The fact that I found him irritating. We're supposed to find him irritating. Right. The accent is a part of his mystique. We don't really know who this guy is. Correct. So I'm willing to admit that maybe the fact that I didn't like Hanks in this movie is kind of the point. But at the same time, it, I, it, it really kept me out of the movie, a lot of it. I think the reason the second and third act of the movie are so good is because of how good Butler is. And, you know, and Lerman is going full tilt, as he always does. I don't think the guy has a slow speed at all. He's he does just, it. Boom. But, yeah, no, I, I really enjoyed it. I didn't love it like you did, but it's it was a great experience in the theater, no question. I will say this. There was only one thing that I didn't – that I really think he whiffed on. Um, first of all – there were no peanut butter and banana sandwiches in the film. <laughs> Disappointing. But number two, uh, I really wanted him to go a little more all in with Austin Butler and him being fat Elvis. That was the only thing I really, you know, we never got to really see Austin Butler as fat Elvis. And well, there fat is Elvis a four is four hour cut. Shut your filthy you never loving read that? mouth. No, there's yeah, a four there's, hour cut yeah, of this movie. Four hours four of articles. that? Really? Yeah, Baz Luhrmann says there is a four hour cut. That he it wants to release eventually. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Listen, <laughs> if I don't get to see this four hour cut, I think Baz Luhrmann's going to send me straight to the Heartbreak Hotel because I'm going to be heartbroken if I don't see this film. I'm down you, for watching it. I want to ask us now like, who, what is the definitive Elvis movie for you? I want to know. Mine is the Kurt Russell, John Carpenter film. And I know it's not canon. I know oh, it's not definitive. But about for me, him. It is. What's the definitive Elvis movie for you guys? Okay, so not necessarily starring him, but about him. Sure. Ooh, that's a tough one. The John Carpenter one is good. I'm not going to lie. But if I, have to, if I have to choose, if I'm on the spot because it's on my mind, Austin Butler as Elvis. No doubt. I think that his performance is so good because he doesn't imitate the character. He literally embodies him like no one. Not even for as good as Kurt Russell is in the John Carpenter Elvis, nobody has done what Austin Butler did because I forgot he was Austin Butler and I thought and I knew he was Elvis. That's how good he was. So he wasn't a Vegas, he wasn't like a, 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 a Vegas showman. Yeah. He was Elvis, and that's why I, I highly, highly compliment him on his performance. Aaron, your pick for my question is 3,000 miles to Vegas, isn't it? Isn't how it? Did you, how did you know that? <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. Yes. It doesn't count because there's so many Elvises in, 3, 000, uh, in that film. It's like, which one's your favorite? Christian Slater, Kurt Russell? There's a lot of Elvises in that movie. 3,000 miles to Graceland. That was that. I tell you what. That's what's sad is is that that movie does not get enough love. Yeah, uh, it does. Kevin Costner. It. it has it has a cult following. There's enough Mad Men like you two who enjoy that film. Yeah, it, it's, it it's has great. a following. It does. Yeah. Uh, Barry, I picked Elvis. Well, what about what's next on your list there? Uh, let's see. Martin Adralin did a film. Uh, it's a Canadian film called Islands. This is my out of nowhere pick. It, it got a little bit of a theatrical release this year. <laughs> Islands is a Canadian film about a Filipino family living in Canada. It's a story of a man living at home with his father. His cousin comes to help him deal with his father. It's a family drama. Uh, you won't see a single bit of it coming. It's highly unpredictable. It's beautiful. It's personal. It's a small movie, but it never felt it never felt like a movie. Even it, it has like a Cassavetti sort of feel like it. It feels real. It's beautifully acted. It's so moving. The film is called Islands. If you remember it, check it out. It's it's a lovely film. It's tough. It's not an easygoing movie, and I won't talk about why. Um, but if you have a chance to see it, it's excellent. So this is a Canadian film about a Filipino family. Most of, uh, mo mo you know, the film is in subtitles and it's a, it's a beautiful movie. So you're telling me that that's better than Easter Sunday with Joe Coy. Uh, that's <laughs> on my list of disappointments, man. I, oh, you know, yeah. 
I wanted to love that movie so hard. I saw the movie opening day, like most of us here on Maui. We're big Joe Coy fans, and I think I laughed twice. Um, it's not his fault. He didn't write the thing. Um, I don't know what happened. I'd love to hear what you guys think. Oh, of that, I can, I can, Coy I can tell you exactly what happened. I, I, yeah. I will not put the, I will put the blame on Joe Coy for this film only because of one reason. He picked the director, and the director is terrible. And I, I hate yeah, to I say, don't even know the, the director. Jay Sandra Kaysar, uh, Chandra Kaysar, the, the guys who did Broken Lizard, the the guys who did oh. Club Dread, the guys who did uh, um, uh, Beer, Beer Fest. Fest? Beer, I love Beer, Beer Fest. Beer Fest, Fest is, is great, great, right? But yeah. Club Dread was not very good. He did the Dukes of Hazard. That sucked. So his track record is, wasn't very good. You sure um, we he can't blame Jay. the screenwriter because you know? Oh that, no, I'm gonna. That Listen, crime a lot of subplot, that, that mob subplot that enters yeah. in the movie, it is, it is terrible. Barry, there's a, more than enough claim to go around. Give it to everybody. But all I'm saying is that I, I hold Joe Quay responsible because it was his movie. He let it get out of control, and he hired that director. And Jay is, I mean, he, he's probably a nice guy, but the films that he makes, I'm sure he, he works on a shoestring budget. I'm sure that he was... I'm sure that he didn't, you know, he wasn't, it didn't cost him a lot of money to make, but yeah, Easter Sunday was uh, a disappointment for sure. And it the crime slot pot was very dumb. good use of Lou Diamond Phillips though. And it was very yes. helpful because yeah. I did not know that Lou Diamond Phillips is Filipino. That was, that you was didn't a nice know part. that. No, bro, no, that was bro. super cool. <laughs> I knew that. I knew that when I was growing up because my mother is Filipino. 100% Filipino, mind you, and she would constantly tell me that Lou Diamond Phillips is Filipino. That's cool. Man, that's good representation. I'm Hungarian. I got Bella Lugosi. You got Lou Diamond Phillips, man. You're one up on that. You. That is true. I got the man. I got the Filipino guy who plays the Mexican guy, Richie Valens. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. And the Native uh, American guy. And, and the Native American guns, guy. So Great. Right. There you go. That's, it's all about representation. It's all, hey, listen, he's great in Young Guns and Young Guns, too. He can it's play fantastic. anything. He can play anything. That's how good he is. Um, uh, Aaron, what about you? So, Islands was Barry's pick. What's yours? What's your next one? Uh, six was Luca Guadagnino's Bones and All. What'd you say? Uh, this movie took me by surprise. Really? Like, going in, I knew it was a cannibal cannibalism movie, but I don't know. There's something about it. I love the whole indie feel and Guadagnino's direction. You know, he's got some impressive visuals going on, and everybody in the cast was great. Even Mark Rylance, who I'm really tired of. <laughs> I think he was good. I don't know. Yeah, this whole me, movie just took me by surprise. And what's, what's funny about Bones and All is it, all, it took me by surprise at how awful it was. Because um, uh, I hated it. Um, and that was one of the worst movies of the year for me. Um, I, I'm glad you enjoyed it, but I despised it. I thought that uh, I thought that uh, uh, what what is his name? Chalamet. Timothy Chalamet. Timothy, Chalamet. Timothy Chalamet was wasted. I thought that the girl that they picked to play uh, I can't her name escapes me at this point. The uh, the the love hey, in, his love interest. Uh, it was as if Zendaya hey, decided to turn down the role and he picked uh, 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 he picked this actress that looked just like Zendaya. That's what it felt like to me. Um, I thought the story was awful. I thought Mark Rylance was awful. Nothing makes sense in that movie to me at all. Nothing. The story is uh, is so out of uh, is so out of pocket that it doesn't even try to make sense of what's actually going on. They're playing this thing as reality, but there's nothing that actually happens that's real, which is just so strange to me. So anyway, I was I, I'm glad you liked it. I completely found it uh, uh, disappointing and kind of disgusting in some respects. Barry, what That's about you? What's great about it? <laughs> what's that? That's what's great about it. It's so unexpectedly disgusting. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and I could I could agree with that to an extent. Uh, this was every year. There's always a couple movies where you know I got to draw a line in the sand with the other critics. This is one of those movies. Um, yep. Yeah, I'm not a fan either. I I didn't hate the film. It's not on my worst of the year list. Um, 
man, it's, it's hard to say exactly where the film went wrong for me. It reminded me a little bit of, of near dark. Like it wants to be like that. It wants to be, you know, on the one hand it's cannibalism, but really we're talking about vampirism or using it as a metaphor for like this, Correct. this transformative experience of these young people. I found the movie really predictable. I think that was my biggest problem. It, the story was very easy to get ahead of. It was obvious that the Mark Rylance character was going to appear um, at later parts of the story. I, I didn't, I mean, I think the most interesting thing about Timothy Chalamet's performance, I think the most revealing thing rather about his performance were his jeans, which looked like they were constantly, he was about to fall out of because they had so many big holes in them. Um, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't a fan of that one. Uh, and and he, look, this director, his prior film was Suspiria. I'm such a fan of Suspiria. That film yeah. was so horrifying yeah, that's a good point. And, and brilliant and beautiful. How good was so that? I never, you know, I'll admit I, my expectations were high that you know his next horror film, yeah, this film just didn't do it for me. There's there's beauty in the film, um, but as a love story, for me, it, you know, if, unless you look at it in terms of subtext, I'm never going to look at the line, um, I want you to eat me bones and all as like the next love. Yes. You know, yes. Love me and have me say yes. you're sorry. Yes. That was sorry, so no, no, no. That was, no, 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 no. That was insane. By the way, that's the kind of, that's the kind of, uh, of, of line in a book that's written for a bunch of young adults. And that's what this, this, what this, and that's exactly what this film is based on a ridiculous young adult novel like Twilight. So just be aware. I, I hated it every single second of it. But I'm um, glad you liked it, Aaron. And you're in good yeah. company. There's a lot of critics who love this yeah. film. I'm, I yeah. just, I couldn't go there. Maybe I'm too cynical. Maybe I love Badlands too much and near dark too much. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I couldn't take that leap of faith and, and I wanted to love it. There's, there's good things in this movie. There's good scenes, good performances, but yeah. And Mark Rylance, I, I am, I am like, you. I'm yeah. very tired of him. I found his performance to be so mannered and, and uh, yeah, I'm not a fan of his, you know, you know, it's okay. Like you said, a lot of people like it. So you're 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 in good company, Aaron, with other people that are deficient. It's it's a it's um now moving on. Isn't it nice that we all agree? No, I honestly I love it when we disagree. I, I love it when we disagree too. I love I think it. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's, not, it's not all a love fest all the time. And no, it's it's good. This look, Aaron, you are hundred percent right. There are so many divisive films this year. This is a big one. This is certainly a big and one for me. I am going I am going to drift right off of, of bones and all with something that is a thousand times better. Okay. And it's just as me it's 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 much more meaningful. And it also it it is also a horror film. Uh Mia Goth and Ty West Pearl was spectacular. Um it, it it is the pre it is this it's the pre sequel to X and it makes X look like a kindergarten movie. Um um Pearl is fantastic. Mia Goth should be nominated for an Oscar for her performance. The story, the mood, the color, everything about Pearl was tremendous i am in i am in utter love with pearl and i really think that if they if ty had done it in order i think pearl would have been better received than x and i think we would have been talking about the i think we would have been talking about people would have been talking about this more earlier in the year um but yeah i thought i, I thought pearl was fantastic barry would say you my number five choice is Pearl. Yeah, yeah. you know, I have the exact same choice as you for number. I mean, I love this movie. Uh, I thought X was good, but this is a whole other level. This is yes. the, the quality of the filmmaking, the performance yeah. by Mia Goth, which is one of the best of the year. Everything about this film is a surprise because it should feel like an unnecessary add on. I remember seeing the trailer for this film, thinking, like, all right, great. He did a, he did a prequel to X, kind of like, well, who cares? This makes me not only so excited for the next film, um, but if anything, yeah, Pearl stands all by itself. If you only see one of the two, definitely see Pearl. It's it's a terrific film. It's much more substantive than X. That's the that's the crazy thing. And they are connected. I don't want to tell you how, but they are connected. And I almost feel like it's unfortunate that they are, because I, you know, after seeing X, there Pearl is so much more rich and full. And I really think that. X, the film X, even for as good as it is, diminishes what happens in Pearl in some respect. Am I, I wrong about that? No, isn't that weird? I completely agree with you. I think 
X to me was a lot like, eh, it's trying to be like tourist trap. It's trying to be like right. a lot of movies we've already seen, but Pearl is like Lucky McGee's May. It's, it's poetic. It's a poetic yes. horror film. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I'm glad you and I have good taste, Barry. Um, Barry, hey, I like uh, that movie. Oh, you did. Fantastic. I love Pearl. Okay, yeah. good. I'm glad it's you not, like it. I didn't hold it up there as high as bones and all, but oh, well, then that's but the problem. Still, but you guys both said everything that needs to be said about Pearl. It's a way better movie than X. Yeah. And that should have come first, like how you said. And, and once again, yes. the violence in this film is much more meaningful, but ironically enough, much less grotesque. Yeah. Agreed. You know what I mean? That's and that's that's I, I that's what I like. I like it anyway. Barry, what, what say you? What 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 else is on your list, sir? Well, I guess I'll jump to my number four then. Um, it, it just gets weird from here on in. Um, Sweet. I adored David Cronenberg's Crimes of the Future. I love this movie. Um, you are a pervert. I do feel like I'm it's a substantial kidding. film in his canon. I yeah. feel like the movie has a lot to say about owning your body and what it means to be a performance art and what art is in general. The movie has a fiendish sense of humor, but it's also very dark and bleak. I feel like the lead performance by Leah Sedois and uh, Kristen Stewart and especially Viggo Mortensen are incredible. I really love this movie. I know it's not an easy sit for most people. It is gross. And at times the gore is very hard to watch. But if you're an adventurous yeah. film goer and you love Cronenberg, I feel like this is... I'm not going to say return to form. He hasn't gone anywhere. His movie's been consistently great. I don't think there's really a bad, well, okay, Map to the Stars. That's the one Cronenberg movie that doesn't work, Map <laughs> to the Stars. But beyond that, I, I do feel like he's one of our greatest living filmmakers, yeah. and I feel like this is definitely one to see more than once. It's interesting to me that, I, it's interesting that you walk, when you see Crimes of the Future, it is vintage Cronenberg, but the irony is, is that you're still surprised by how far it was willing to go you know what yeah. i mean you're going you're watching a david cronenberg film I'm, i shouldn't be surprised about anything but yet i was still like oh you know i was doing the wow this is this is not what i was expecting walking into this i do understand why that is a weird pick because it is not a, it is not on my best of list i mean that but i will say that i i i do have the same reaction that you do I, I'm, you know, it's, it's David Cronenberg and it's, he, he goes places that some filmmakers are unwilling to go. And the fact that he even got this thing funded is yeah. crazy. So yeah. good on him for that. But yeah, good pick. Crimes of the Future. Did you get to watch that, Aaron? Yeah. And? I actually bought it on Voodoo and uh, Barry was so excited. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I'm, I love Cronenberg. So, I enjoyed it. Yeah. So Crimes of the Future, um, uh, if you have the stomach for that filmmaker and if you enjoy his films or if you're adventurous, watch it. Am I, that, that, is that fair? If you know his yeah. stuff, yeah. you'll yeah, be okay with it, I think. All right, Aaron. All right, hit me. Make up for What's bones and all. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I'm kind of afraid. But, uh, five, ah, man, I really love this movie. I I was thinking about putting it higher, but I really love this movie. Is the Woman King? Mm. Ooh, like very controversial pick. You really liked it, huh? I really liked it. Like, this movie had me cheering after the movie ended, and I was just like so enthralled by this movie. Um, I think I've said this story before, but I'll say it again for everybody that's watching and or listening. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Viola Davis wasn't the first pick. Uh, to play the lead, it was Lupita Nyongo. She was, and that I, I personally think that she would have been the perfect fit for this film. Um, there were reasons that she turned it down. She had done research on the Dahomey tribe, and she was very. She is from Africa, so there were some issues that she had regarding that. Um, but I will say that if we look at the if we look at the Woman King as just historical fiction, I think it. I think it's actually very good. Um, it's in, it's definitely enjoyable. I, I I I it was not on my best of list, Aaron, but I I am with you uh, on the pick, Barry. What about you? Well, I think Viola Davis's performance is one of the best of the year, if for no other reason. 
you know, I thought she peaked with Fences, although she's given so many amazing performances. I never would have thought to replace her, you know, replace Lupita Nyong'o with Viola Davis. And I'll admit, it's like, uh, you know, if you, on paper you think like, can she really do this? You know, and she does. No, she can't. She's clearly that caliber of actress. She can she's play great. anything. She's incredible. The action sequences are exciting. I think the weakness of the film, and it doesn't, it doesn't kill the film, but I mean, it's, it. There are a lot of connect the dots storytelling here. There's, this is one of those movies where it's like a Star Wars universe where the twist is that everybody's related in some way. I, I'm kind of tired of that twist where it's like, turns out you're related. Okay, fine. Um, a lot of movies have done that and gotten away with yeah. it. I think this movie, for the most part, does. It, it's it's a really exciting film. I really enjoyed it, and you know, it, it plays on a very big scale of storytelling. But really, it, the performances are everything, and, and at the center of it is Viola Davis, who's fantastic. Yeah. Um. So, Woman King on your list. Well, I guess I, I, does that mean it's my turn, Aaron? I think it's my. Yep. All right. Next on my list, I will let me um let me uh. Let's see here. What did I put? Well, um, without a doubt, I already gave you Pearl. Let me give you another. Um, another film that uh, I thought was spectacular and is one of my best of best films of the year. It is a, it is a film from India called R R R. Um, if you have not seen it, it is currently on Netflix. Uh, it is without a doubt one of the most exciting pictures, one of the most visually sumptuous movies I have seen in a long, long time. I'm going to tell you something. This movie and its director tries to fit in a span of three hours and I think 12 minutes, 15 minutes. It is action. It is a musical. It is a romantic comedy. It is a drama. It is melodrama. It is a superhero film. It is, every, it is all of these genres stuffed into this three-hour package that shouldn't work, like, at all. And it works to a D. It was one of the most exciting, one of the most fun, one of the most incredibly acted Acted films I have seen this year. It is an Indian film called RRR. You will not be disappointed. Go watch it immediately. And the less I tell you about it, the better. It is phenomenal. RRR. Check it out. Did you guys get to see it? No, I haven't seen it yet. I know um, uh, Nerdwatch movie critic Jason David is a big fan of it. I've been wanting to watch it. RRR is amazing. It is it's on incredible. Netflix. It's on Netflix right now. Netflix. Now, interesting. There's a there's a little bit of a controversy considering that on Netflix, it's not. It's in an it's an original uh, Indian dialect. It's in another dialect. I'm not sure why. I've never really researched it. But watching it on here, it doesn't hurt the film. Uh, I would love to see it in in its original dialect for sure. Uh, but I, I was completely floored by how tremendously good R R R is. It is fantastic. It should be nominated for best foreign film of the year. And in my opinion, should win. But did you see the post released by the Academy, the actual Academy? No. What I miss? They they released a couple of photos of Oscar shortlists, movies that I guess they have right now in contention for the Oscars. And I guess they're going to X out whatever or whatever. But that movie is on there for best foreign language film. Cool. Good. It should be, yeah. and it should win. It is tremendous. If did, Aaron, did you see it? Uh, I tried watching it after you recommended it, and I couldn't get through it. <laughs> oh, oh, man. What is wrong with uh, you? <laughs> what is wrong with you? I could oh, unbelievable. Here's your comeback for Bones there's, and All. There's my comeback, oh, Bones man. and All. Good, Just like good. your Fablemans. It took good, me good, three good. tries to watch the Fablemans. <laughs> three good. tries? Yeah. Good. Yeah, so apparently you don't like Indian filmmaking, so uh, that's a that's a strike against hey, you. Hey. Not me. <laughs> so. I do, but... <laughs> I, I highly recommend that you turn it on again. Put your headphones on. Don't be bothered. It is tremendous. Tremendous. I, I, I loved every single second of that film, and I was not. Two of your movies I had a hard time getting through. I can't even believe it. <laughs> All right, Barry. What else is on your list, sir? 
Uh, Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. I love this film. I, I think it's a, I, I do think it's a new, it's it just a new step up for, for stop motion animation. I love the emotion of it. I love the music. I thought the vocal performances were wonderful. What a strange thing that Kate Blanchett plays this monkey and it's a nonverbal performance. And I think it's hysterical, but moreover, the, the film is dark. It is mournful. It is existential. It is dealing with how we put our love and life into memories and we carve them into wood. So the movie is dealing with loss, but it's also a cheerful chipper film. So I feel like the, the balance of tones is there. It's magical it, in terms of its sense of humor. And what it achieves and achieves in stop motion, I would compare it to The Nightmare Before Christmas. I love this movie. Wow. Uh, I would say that it was actually one of my disappointments of the year. Unfortunately, I didn't feel I, I felt that there were things there that was that were very well done, but I felt by the end of the film, I felt like there was there was very little hope, and I felt it, it felt very dour to me. It's a very adult, it's a very an adult themed Pinocchio. So for that, I will give it credit. But yeah, I I it just it didn't. It didn't hit me the way I, I was expecting, and I think that that's my that was my disappointment of it. So, but I'm glad you enjoyed it. Aaron, did you watch it? Robert Zemeckis, man, he is. <laughs> <He's shot. laughs> oh, wow, that should tell no, you. That's, that's the only Pinocchio I watched was the Zemeckis one. Wow, oh, uh, really? <laughs> wow, Bear, uh, uh, Aaron, what about you? What else is on your list? Uh, my four is from one of my favorite directors, so I, maybe I'm a little biased, but 13 Lives from Ron Howard. Ah, you know, Ron Howard, when he makes movies about real people, he's really at his peak, and this is like one of them. The way he staged the rescue is perfect, and it's just an intense, thrilling movie. And again, Ron Howard tells a great story through this so real event. So are you saying that Splash is not any good? Splash is great. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was just checking. Every one of his checking. movies is great. I can't think of a movie I hate from him. I love I love Ron Howard. I, you know, to be fair to you, because I, I was just kidding. Well, the, I've only, you, you, I haven't seen that? one movie by Ron Howard, though. Which I is? I say that. Which There's is? only one movie I haven't seen, which is what? Willow. <laughs> you haven't seen Willow. Oh, my gosh. You haven't gosh, seen Aaron. Willow. That's, the, That's okay. not the one you there. skip. Do no, yourself no. a favor. Avoid the Willow on Disney Plus and just go watch the movie Willow directed by Ron Howard. It I have is fantastic. When, is it not huh? good? I haven't seen the new Willow yet. Is it not good? It's tr oh, That's it's trash. Bad. It is absolute trash. Um, don't get me started. But it's 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 not good. But watch Willow. I can't believe you've never seen Willow. No. I will agree I had, with you about what I had Willow in one hand and I had Night Shift in the other hand. Oh, shut up. <laughs> oh man! Shut up. <laughs> Night Shift's a great movie, by the way. Ron Howard, I, I will say that he does excel in actual, uh, like real life films. Rush is one of my favorite movies uh, with uh, Chris Hemsworth. Um, the uh, Rush was fantastic. Uh, so yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, so uh, wow, the amazing! I want to say my, the paper. That's my favorite Ron Howard movie. That's the, the so paper. I agree with you. Real movie about real people. I agree. Backdraft, oh. another good one. Uh, yeah, oh yeah. Good yeah, heck yeah. yeah. All right, next on my list of films uh, this year. Uh, what we have? Three more? Four more? Is what? What is it? Uh, three. Three more. All right. Well, uh, I may be one short, but of course this should be a no-brainer. Um, and like I said, minor in no particular order. Uh, Top Gun Maverick, uh, one of the best films of the year. Um. Uh, uh, not only did it resurrect filmmaking, it resurrects the spirit of uh, of of movie going, and I was highly entertained. And I'm going to tell you something: this movie is almost, almost a is almost a perfect is almost a perfect partner with the original film. In and I say almost only because this movie <laughs> thematically is so tame compared to the original Top Gun that this movie <laughs> almost could have been PG if she didn't say the one F word in Top Gun Maverick. 
but the action sequences were tremendous. The aviation sequences were spectacular. I thought the performances were very well done. There wasn't anything incredibly cheesy about the filmmaking. Everybody played their role spectacularly. Uh, the Val Kilmer and Tom Cruise scene with Ice and Mav was just, that was, oh, filled my heart with so much love for the both of them, uh, for the characters. Uh, Top Gun Maverick is one of the best movies of the year. Period. Anyway, I uh, hope you guys felt the same. Good take. I love it. I do. I, I have a few problems with it. I'll, I'll say because people I don't do. typically talk about the things about it they don't like. I I didn't care about the young cast that much. Uh, for me, it was very similar to the young cast of Independence and Insurgents. You know, Independence and Insurgents. I just I didn't care who the new people were. I don't. I don't. Um, I cared about oh the old people. I didn't care about the young people. Um, it's it's not necessarily Glenn Powell or, or Miles Teller's fault. I mean, I think those those characters are more plot devices and they are really, yes. really well fleshed I out agree. characters. I agree. There's a scene at the beginning of the film, people rarely comment on it, where after Maverick survives the crash, uh, he walks into this Norman Norman Rockwellian bar, this little pub, and he's you know, and he's and he's you know covered in soot and he orders a water and they're all looking at him. It's one of the many scenes in the movie where I go like, I'm watching a movie. This doesn't even feel real. This, this is so you know yeah. elevated. Um, and I think the movie gets away with it because even though it's not going to be one of these films where we talk about being one of the great screenplays of the year, they figured out what to do with the scenes that we want with Tom Cruise and Dal Kilmer. Oddly enough, that scene I thought was so moving and so beautiful in a way that didn't feel forced or cloying. I thought like this is really smart. And the scenes with Jennifer Connelly, Connelly was playing a role that easily could have been just a throwaway. She invested it with such life and such layers. It speaks a lot to how she is as an actress. Um, yeah. And of course, John Hamm is wonderful. There's this film. It, it is an actor's film in a way that the original movie was more of a movie star film. I love Anthony Edwards, but I don't think we'd look at Top Gun and go, well, he was amazing in Top Gun. But the actors in this movie are really quite wonderful. And as an action yeah. film, it's, it's I don't know that anything else this year came close. I agree 100 percent with you. And by the way, uh, let me share this really as a quick side note. Do you know the, the, the there's a theory behind uh, in the. Uh, there's a there's a theory going online about this movie that you may got you guys may not know about. I'm gonna guess that he actually dies at the beginning. Is that what it is? That's the one. Yes, I knew it. That, 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 so, so, like, he's so actually the, dead through the whole film. Right, this right. So the suspense ruined all of this. The theory is is that once he goes up into the experimental plane at the beginning and we see him in the cafe, it, we, we we he actually crashes and he dies. And his his afterlife starts in that cafe. That's funny that you mentioned that scene. That's hilarious. So it's for, it was pretty interesting. Anyway, um, uh, you can check it out. It's pretty funny. I, I actually thought that makes kind of sense. It, it's it's fun to, to to do those kinds of things. But uh, Barry, what about you? What else is on your list? Since I did Top Gun, what do you got? Yeah. So number two, I'm on number two because it turns out you and I both have a, have a love for, for Pearl. So uh, number two for me is one of the most divisive, if not the most divisive film of the year. Um, oh, I can't wait. It's a tough one because there's some movie critics that I love and respect so much who I know are not happy with me right now because of this. Um, and, you know, I know it's not neither here nor there. I didn't write or direct this movie, but I'm such a fan of Babylon. I love this movie so much. I know it's vulgar and disgusting and shocking and offensive. I know that, but I think the movie knows that as well. People are talking about this film like it's some big kiss, kiss, love letter to Hollywood. It's not. It's about how films encapsulate the things that we lost and the people that we've lost. Uh, movies as the, uh, the the final monologue that Gene Smart gives. Movies are a way of projecting angels and ghosts. Movies are a way of telling versions of stories that never happened. Films are lies. And as we know, there are, not always, but there are a lot of monsters behind the camera. And this movie is telling us how it's cyclical, how there are awful people behind the camera in 1922 as there are in 2022. This movie did not need to be a period piece. It could be set today. It's a long film, I know. I wouldn't cut a frame of it. I do love this film. I love the the crazy Tobey Maguire sequence. I love the sequence of chasing the light before the light leaves, and I certainly love the sequence of uh, a, a sound uh, a sound uh, studio uh, being a, a disaster area for for a first time filmmaker doing doing sound. There's so many great scenes, so many great performances. I feel like it earns the right to talk about the really controversial and shocking things that are there. 
And I think some of the best scenes, like for example, the way it, it explores the topic of blackface, I thought this is smart. It does it in a visual way. It doesn't talk it. It doesn't become didactic. It's not a film that talks too much. If, if anything, I feel like, you know, this film could be longer though. I don't think anybody agrees with me. Um, I know it's divisive and I know a lot of people are grossed out by it. I suspect people, if you didn't walk out in the first 10 minutes, you'll probably walk out as soon as Tobey Maguire shows up. I think over time people will connect to this film, but really it's not this, this celebration of Hollywood movie making. It's about loss and it's about how movies capture us and capture our lives, even though what they're showing us is not always the truth. So I love Babylon. I did. Well, I did not like it as much as you did, for sure. I think I told you about that. I I, I do feel that uh, 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 that Hollywood likes to 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 butter itself up, as it were, for sure. This wasn't that film. You're right about that. I thought that the performances themselves were. I I think I told you this off the air, um, off of the show, is that. There are performances in here that are tremendous. There are scenes that are just tremendous. The the monologue between Brad Pitt and Gene Smart was one of my favorite, one of one of my favorite scenes of the year. It is tremendous. But I was not as enraptured by it as you were. I thought the Tobey Maguire thing. I did not. I I, did, I thought that was worthless. I thought it was stupid. I hated every single second of it because it it was a waste. Um. I I yeah. I hated it. But I will say this. I thought that the that ending was spectacular that ending was how can i put this pure in some respects um and 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 it just it was very well done um but uh i thought once again i thought margot robbie just my problem was that I i i felt that margot robbie overplayed her role I mean, Brad Pitt did the same, but she overplayed it in some respects with a kind of it was almost like she was doing like she was halfway in and halfway out of doing Harley Quinn. You know what I mean? She even had that little bit of an accent that was going on. I don't know if you guys noticed it, but anyway, yeah, I didn't love it as much as you guys, but I will give I will give it its due. Um, So, yeah, it is. It's definitely a long sit for sure. So, yeah, um, I'm glad that someone in this room enjoyed it. So good for you, Barry. (laughs) No, I think Aaron liked it too. Actually, <laughs> I think Aaron enjoyed it as well. Uh, Aaron, what about you? What's what else is on your list? Uh, this can be a quick one, but number three was Hunt from South Korea. Uh, man, this is like the best action movie this year, I think. It is so good. The uh, star of Squid Game stars in it, writes it, produced it, and it's like Infernal Affairs. With John Woo and Michael Mann action. Oh, it is, I like I liked Infernal Affairs, so I, I may want to watch this. It thing. is quite the ride, and the way he directs these action scenes is so big. A lot of gun fights, a lot of you know stuff like that. It's so good. A wow. great spy story and a great action movie. Yeah, South. Uh, there was a couple of um, of South Korean movies that actually were that looked very good. So yeah, I want to see the hunt. Did we get? Did we happen to get those as well? I didn't see that. Uh, I, no, I, bought, that. I bought that one on Voodoo. Oh, did you? Okay, I'll go look. Yeah. For, I'll, I'll go look for the hunt then. All right, fantastic. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, certainly last but not least for me, it's. I think this is going to be the last one for me because I don't think I have any more. Uh, I do not. Um, and what, well, like I said, these are in no particular order for me. One of the best movies of the year, and it still stands even after it's released so early this year. Matt Reeves, the Batman. Um, uh, spectacular film. Uh, spectacular story. Spectacular performances. He really captured the essence of the dark night, and he really captured the essence of what it would be to be a Batman that is a street hero, a literal street hero in that respect. Uh, story, I, you know, this movie's three hours long. To me, it didn't feel that at all. Now, not everything is perfect in this film, but it is, it is without a doubt just close to perfect. Uh, I've watched this movie several times afterwards. I cannot get it out of my head. Robert Pattinson, in my opinion, is the best Batman ever, wow. ever, period. Just Batman. And the I reason swear. why I <laughs> Affleck's good. Not going to lie. Affleck is good. But Robert Pattinson as Batman is spectacular. 
And the reason why, you know, a lot of people weren't impressed with his Bruce Wayne, it's because we have to let this character marinate. He's still in his second year. And once again, that gives them a lot of leeway to make mistakes with the character because he's such a he's so young in his career as Batman. Uh, and the revelation at the end was very well done. Um, the, I was blown away at how good the Batman is. So that's probably one of the best films of the year for me. Barry, great. What do you think of that? And then uh, what? I liked it a lot. Um, I, I think Colin Farrell gave one of the most amazing performances of the year. I think Warner Brothers did a very unwise thing by telling us he's even in the film because I suspect if he had gone un unbilled, I don't think anybody would have known who that actor was. Um, I do feel like in a, this was a banner year for him, whether we're talking about Banshees of Ina Sharon or after Yang. I mean, he gave so many great performances. It was a great year for him, but I do feel like this is a, the, the triumph on top of all triumphs because he is unrecognizable. He is electrifying. I yeah. wanted more Penguin. And I know he's getting his own, his own series. That's fine. But just taking it, um, in terms of what his, his contribution to this film is, I thought it was was incredible. I think the sequence involving the Penguin and the unveiling of the Batmobile is one of the best sequences of the year. You know, I, I'm definitely in that camp that thinks the movie's too long, if only because I think the third act goes on a bit too extent. I, I just feel like the third act just it, it it should be a lot shorter. But I do think it's a really strong movie. I do. I really enjoyed it. I like the pun you did there. You, the uh, Colin Farrell going unbilled as the Penguin. That was pretty. Oh! I didn't even realize it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Barry, now that I've mentioned one of the best films of the year in the Batman, what say you? Oh, I'm about to lose you both. We were uh, we were enjoying some moments of goodwill there. It's all about yeah. to go away. It's about to go <laughs> bye bye because uh, one of the most divisive films of the year is my favorite film of the year. It's a uh, Daniel. Daniel Kwan and Daniel Scheinert's Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. I love this movie. I all right, you lost me. ahead of it. And inevitably, you know, when you're dealing with all that Matrixy stuff, I think that's the only part of the film. Like I've seen this, I know what this is. The film kept surprising me. Uh, it took insane risks, uh, bizarre risks, the kind you don't ever see in mainstream movies, let alone even in A24 films. It's a bonkers movie. But uh, the performances I thought were were flawless. Everybody in the, in the movie is wonderful. Everyone's taking a big, big, big risk, big swing. Um, yeah, the, the originality of it, and, and nothing. But really, none of that would matter if it did, film didn't have heart. I feel like this is a really deeply moving film about a family and a family experience. Um, yeah, I, I just I love this movie. I can't say enough about it. For me, it's another eternal sunshine on the spotless mind. It's one of these films. It's very hard to describe, but it, it just needs to be experienced. Ah. Oh. All of you critics and all everybody that fawns over the ridiculousness of this everything, everywhere, all at once movie. I don't get it. It has heart. Heart about what? It tells me the film this that, that you should care about nothing. Like what? Like holy what? You're telling me nothing matters. Okay. Oh, and all of a sudden it has a heart. I hated every single solitary <laughs> second. <laughs> Of this horrendous, over dramatic, overly ridiculous film, it was awful. This movie, in my, I will, I will watch it again, only to watch the hot dog fingers because that that was so stupid. But anyway, please tell um, us how you really feel. This movie is visually spectacular. This movie is visually is tremendous. The action sequences are off the hook, but guess what? It doesn't have a brain. It tries to be so. It, it tries to be so philosophical. It tries this whole Chinese philosophy on us, throwing us off our game. Oh my gosh! Oh, you know what my favorite universe was? Oh, the rock universe. Oh, really? You'd love to be a rock? You're a moron. Anyway, I just these this movie. That the movie sucked. Okay. The and the everything bagel. Really? This is where we're going. This this is it. This is the tremendous film of 2022. Everything everywhere all at once. And the everything bagel that gets sucked into it. Oh my gosh. Give me a break. This movie was trash. Absolute trash. Anyway, sorry. No. It's You're not so sorry. Don't apologize for that. <laughs> I hated it. 
Aaron, can you bring us back up from the? <laughs> Don't ask Aaron years? what he thought of that movie. Don't ask <laughs> no, him. No, no, I'm not going to ask him. What I am going to ask him is to bring us back from the depths of the awfulness that was everything, everywhere, all in a, a once, and give us your final film. Or are you at number two? Are you? I just can't believe I agree with you on that one. Ah, very good. <laughs> you have good taste. Golly, this goes to show. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. By the way, just really fast. I this think it's a very sh- overrated movie. It is incredibly overrated. And not only that, the fact that people like everything, everywhere, all at once, especially with the content of the film, goes to show you where we're at feel, uh, mentally for me. This is where we're at now. We love films that tell us that nothing matters. Well, that's because your, 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 your life is as vapid as your social media content. That's okay, exactly so what it is. Two, uh... Thank you. <laughs> Pretty good, thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Get me off of this thing. Get okay. me off of this crazy train. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm okay. sorry. Uh, well, both of you did your number one, so I'll just do it real quick. Number two is exact same as Barry, Babylon. Wow. I love that movie. I, I've watched it. What I'm like on my fourth time right now. <laughs> it is so good. I loved every <sighs> single minute of that movie. I, I, I will tell you this. I like Babylon a lot better than everything, everywhere, all at once. I hope so. I can I tell you that for that's sure. very clear, Greg. <laughs> 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 all right, uh, um, Aaron, because because so, because Barry and I shared yeah. uh, movies in our list. What was your number one film of the year? So my number one um, is the Netflix German All the Quiet All Quiet on the Western Front. All I was that was one of my picks, but it, it the reason why it came down was because of RRR. Uh, all quiet on the Western Front. I, I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you, did Barry, did you get a chance to see it? Finally, not yet, you not, did not. Yeah, okay, I got four days, I got four days to, to see these movies. It's on the list, it is. It is um, gonna play at Kaumanu though, here in Maui. I heard that, yeah, that's so exciting. I'm gonna I'm gonna watch it because, all quiet up now. Now, like I said, Barry, it's a very it's 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 very controversial because. They do change the ending of the original film. And I thought, I almost feel that it was inappropriate to do so yeah. in that respect. But judge for everyone, judge for yourself. I do think that is, I think Aaron is correct. I think it is, it is currently on Netflix. If you'd like to watch it, um, watch it, see it. If you've never seen the original, do that as well. All Quiet on the Western Front is one of the greatest films ever made. Um, and uh, highly recommend it. And then go and watch the new one. Uh, give yourself a couple of days and watch the new film. Um, um, I don't want to say much because Barry hasn't seen it yet, but I, I'm, I'm in agreement with you. It's one Very of the brutal. One of the great, yeah, great film. It, it really shows the horrors of war. For sure. 100%. Tremendously. Yeah. Um, so just to let everybody know as well, um, uh, that, is our, that is our best of list so far. Um, Couple of things. Number one, we're going to move on to some of our disappointments. We're just going to go rapid fire through those. But we also know that the um, the Hawaii Film Critics Society will be putting out its official best of list next year. Uh, Barry, can you give us any info about that? Yeah, January sixth is when we release the nominations. Uh, I'll, I'll release that not only on the on the Hawaii Film Critics Society Facebook page, but also on hifilmcriticssociety.org. Um, and also, I believe on January 13th, I think 13th is with the, the day that we settled on this year. 13th is when we're going to release our list of the best of 2022. And that'll be everything from the categories you expect, like best actor, best actress. And then it gets really wild, like, you know, best science fiction film, best comic book movie. It's a very eclectic list, and I'm really happy to share it. Um, I always love the choices that everybody comes up with. The fact that we have as many members as we do, we're able to, you know, sometimes – you know, sometimes you think you know what 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 the top choices are going to be, and sometimes it just completely flips. It's really fun for me to be able to count up the votes and see hey, how it all. Well, listen, out. I I do know that the Hawaii Film Critics Society has an affinity for Anya Taylor Joy. I mean, she her film uh, last was last night in Soho. Yeah, last night in Soho was the best picture for Hawaii Film Critics Society. As a matter of fact, Edgar Wright said because of our pick, he wanted to move here. So that's uh. Well, 
he is deal. he is yet to take us up on that, but I, I, sincerely, <laughs> I sincerely hope he does because yeah, we're we're big fans of that movie and big fans of Edgar Wright, obviously. Uh, absolutely, no, and you're right. Yeah. Anya Taylor Joy has a strangely high risk of being on the list this year because of all the movies she was in. Yeah. She's in some great films, and not a, but see, this is what's great about the Hawaii Film Critics Society is that we don't we don't for as much as we like some of the more you would say some of the more films that that Hollywood and most critics have in common. We do go off. Uh, we do go off the beaten path, which I really yes, enjoy. The first Our best year, some, enough people nominated Jupiter Ascending for best costume design. I'm like, wow, this is insane. No one else yeah. is, is nominating this. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it's really fun to see all the. I mean, you know, we one year uh, James McAvoy, of course, was best actor uh, for for uh, for Split, which was which was also a wonderful surprise and deserved too. He's fantastic in that movie. Yeah, yeah. So very cool. So January sixth um, is our uh, is our voting, and the nominations, and then the thirteenth will be the uh, official list of the best of, and uh, I'm sure that there will be some people uh, very happy in Hollywood that we picked their movie. So that's going to be so. fantastic. <laughs> we shall see. Now, uh, really quick, we got about maybe twenty minutes or so before we have to actually get out of here. Um, really quick, uh, Barry, I'm going to start with you. Uh, what are some of your biggest disappointments of uh, 2022? Admittedly, I need to see it again because I haven't stopped thinking about it. But I mean, I, I'm still really disappointed by Jordan Peele's Nope. I'm not a fan of it. Um, I've been, I found it so frustrating. I found it really consistently annoying. At times, I'm thinking this movie just isn't working. Um, and I've had many others say, No, no, you need to see it a second time or a third time because that's when the movie really happens. And, and I, I will revisit it because there are memorable imagery images in the film. There are good performances, but for me, that was a big one. I was looking forward to it so much last summer. That was the big one for me. And I, I walked out of the theater going, what was that? Because I loved get out. I think us, I thought was phenomenal, but yeah, Nope was, yeah. Didn't play for me. Wow. Uh, Aaron, you have, uh, uh, you have some disappointments this year. Uh, the fable men's the fable men's the fable men's. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, I think the biggest one for me is because I'm such a lover of the genre. But George Clooney and Julia Roberts in Ticket to Paradise. You shut your ever loving I wanted mouth. I love that movie. I love that movie. I loved it. You know why? Let me tell you something. It wasn't your typical ridiculous romantic comedy. It was much deeper than that and much more reflective than that. I loved Return to Paradise. Is it Return to It's Return a Ticket to Paradise. Ticket, 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 Ticket to, to Paradise. Paradise. Return to Paradise, a much better film starring <laughs> yeah. Vince Vaughn and Anne Heche. <laughs> it's a great film. Really. Did you watch Ticket to Paradise, Barry? Yes, I did. Yeah. And I, you didn't I, like I, it, did you? Not at all. I, no, I loved it. I think it's a great film if you're a young 13-year-old girl who wants to move to Bali and marry the first person <laughs> you meet and, and you know be and live in, live as a seaweed farmer and and really stick it to your parents who are wrong about everything you think. <laughs> it's I such a had, fantasy. No, I'm not a it, fan. No, of and that's but see and it it felt like I I I agree with that, but I felt like it it they made it feel as down to earth as they possibly could. It wasn't like it's not like, you know, it's not like stuff you see on the Hallmark channel. You know what I mean? It's not it was very different. I thought the relationship between Julia Roberts and George Clooney was very well done. I well, the thought Hallmark I, channel movies are better than Shut your mouth. Return to, uh, excuse me, Ticket to Paradise was, I had a great You don't even know the title. That's all. Ticket to Paradise was a great, was a great so film. Good. All right. Yeah. Well, let me, uh, let me give you, uh, let me give you my list of disappointments. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, let me, uh, let me uh, go. Uh, my, one of my biggest disappointments of the year was The Whale with Brendan Fraser. Um, yes. I wanted to like that movie, but guess what? I hated it. And not only did I hate it, I hated Brendan Fraser's character or his portrayal of that character. I thought it stunk. I thought his character was awful and he was never redeemed by the end of the film. I did not like the whale. Um, and further, if anybody sees the whale, just know that fat people do not eat like Brendan Fraser's character in the whale. Okay? They do not. Okay? Just want to let everybody know that. <laughs> It's true. It's true. It does. You don't put ketchup packets on, on pizza. Is, that, there's no truth this, to this. This skinny person's fantasy of what fat people eat, how they actually eat is ridiculous. It's stupid. It does. That's the, it, 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 anyway, I'm not going to even go into it. It's dumb. Don't, 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 don't believe uh, the hype, it. It was right? disappointing. 
They they're were. super disappointing. Uh, but I will say that Samantha Morton and uh, Sadie Sink were great in the film. That was the only thing that I really liked. And the and the the caregiver, she's in the menu. Oh yeah, she's yeah, in the she's menu. In I can't, this... Yeah, she's good in that film. She's she's, she's like right? the she's like the, yeah. uh, the she's like the Chinese Mark Rylance. Um, <laughs> wow, what a. <laughs> I don't know how to feel about that. <laughs> um, uh, another one of my biggest disappointments of the year was Lightyear because that was horrible. Um, everything, everywhere, all at once. I don't have to go over that again. Uh, bones and all. Bones and all, obviously. Uh, Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio was a huge disappointment for me. Um, Bardo was not a great film. Um, not Didn't like that very much. Uh, Babylon, even though it was good, was definitely a disappointment. And I would say last, but certainly not least, one of the biggest disappointments of 2022 is Avatar, The Way of Water. That movie was not good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what? It wasn't. A dramatic pause. <laughs> it was not good. Um, and so I would have to tell you that um, if you liked, if you like the first one, you'll like the second one. Yeah, but if you, you do not like the first one at all. I so. do not. And I thought that, once again, I did not can't j count James Cameron out because his tendency with sequels are always much better than his originals, and he had a good track record until now. Um, so um, if you like the first one, you'll love the second one. I will say visually, spectacular. Everything looked real. Nothing looked digital. I will give him that. But this movie was <laughs> down right terrible and the more i think about it the more angry i get about it um but i will say there is one strong theme in this film that he finally got that was missing from the first film the the theme of family and the sticking together and the fat one of my favorite one, one of my favorite phrases in the film that he kind of coins is your family is your fortress and i thought that was good and that's very relatable for people with kids and families that makes sense those you you that you're a team that was that was very much a very cool kind of concept and i to it totally worked unfortunately for james cameron he's so enamored with making these uh, navi tribes so different that he forgot to make the story um better and that was one of the biggest disappointments for me so for as good as it looks unfortunately there's nothing under the hood uh, it's how, how can I put this? Um, it, 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 it's all beauty, no brains. So, um, if you, uh, I was going to say, well, yeah, I'm not going to even name, but yeah, it's all beauty, no brains. Don't, don't, it's, it's not, it's not great, but anyway, uh, any, before we, uh, say aloha to all, um, anything else you'd like to talk about this year? Anything, any honorable mentions, did anybody like to talk about or anything that they say went under the radar that didn't get uh, seen that you think would be uh, good to watch? Oh, <clears throat> my top one for that is uh, Emily the Criminal. Mm. Oh, the one with, with um, Aubrey Plaza. Aubrey Plaza, yeah. Yeah. I will definitely watch that. I have that. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing it. Yeah. Looking forward to seeing it. Barry, anything under the radar the, that went by uh, in 2022? You know, my the, the two of the films that did make my top ten list. I mean, everybody's seen them. One is the menu. Menu is doing really well. It's one of the few, uh, you know, adult-minded sleepers that's done really well. I thought it was beautifully acted. And and talk about a movie that takes off like a rocket. It just gets going. It doesn't have like a lot of backstory. It just like it. It just really utilizes every minute. And I thought uh, Ray Fiennes and certainly Anya Taylor Joy were wonderful in that movie. And another one, I mean, everybody's seen it, but I really loved Wakanda Forever, Black Panther 2. I thought it was great. I thought they really handled uh, the death of T'Challa beautifully in a really, really meaningful way, as opposed to making it feel cloying or, you know, or just exploitive, which I think we all feared. Um, I think in some ways it's a stronger movie. Even I, I love the villains. I thought they were fascinating. I thought their backstory was, was so intriguing. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I think Ryan Coogler, I mean, this is, you know, some of these Marvel movies, they seem like they weren't even directed. You know, they just seem like, okay, like this is what the expectations are. And there you go. Coogler is a muscular filmmaker. And I feel like we're really seeing a guy with a sense of style, with a real sense of grandiose storytelling. Um, it's character first with him. There's a lot of scenes in the movie of characters just sitting and talking. And the movie is all the better for it. I think it's a rich film, a beautiful film. It's not just a great comic book movie. It's a great movie, period. See, and that's and see, this is what I this is what I was expressing to everybody. This is this is the most non-Marvel Marvel movie 
in the fact that everybody's performances are pretty much spot on. I don't, I, I, there were things that I was disappointed about. The Riri Williams character was not that fleshed out, could have been a lot better, but you're right. Everything else was great. I thought everybody else's performance from Angela Bassett on were just tremendous. Um, um, and so, yeah, I, I completely agree with you uh, on the black, uh, the black Panther pick Wakanda forever. Well, I, I do have a couple of gems that uh, you may have missed. Uh, number one, it wasn't mentioned in our best of list, but the unbearable weight of massive talent. Uh, watch it. Nick Cage. It's, uh, it's tremendous. Uh, I highly, highly recommend that film. Also, on my list of uh, honorable mentions, if you haven't seen it, do watch it. It's called The Fall. Okay? It's called The Fall. It's about two women that decide to climb a very, very big pole. And you're, ta- you're thinking to yourself, gee, Greg, what kind of film would you say? How good of a film is a movie about uh, uh, people climbing a very, very tall pole? Well, it's a radio tower, and the movie takes off from there. That's a very good film. That's a, I think that's a hidden gem. I highly recommend that. Hey, I know also- a podcast that did a great episode on that movie. Oh, I believe it's called So I Married a Film Critic. Ah, very good. Um, uh, thank really you for the episode. plug, Aaron. <laughs> did you really not like it? Episode. Did you not like it, Barry? I did. I liked it a lot, actually. That's something yeah. that, that I talk about with my wife. On okay, good. I didn't so get to see it. I didn't get to hear it. So. Spotify. Um, good. Uh, we, we talk about <laughs> it. Now, I, what I liked about it. I thought. I think it's brilliantly made. I mean, it's a B movie script, B movie yes. performances. But in terms of technical ability, I mean, it, it is. It's a tour de force of filmmaking. The special effects are excellent. The pacing, the music, the sound. It's lean. It's a very yeah, lean film. It's a B film, but this is how you do it. Um, yeah, I, feel I the agree. Same way about it as I do something like Pitch Black or. Um, even the first Fast and Furious. I mean, it's just it's a B film, but man, it is state of the art. It's great. Scott Mann um, has has been a director for quite some time, and this is the film that he'll he'll probably be known for. He did a he did a great film uh, a couple years ago with Dave Bautista and Pierce Brosnan. I don't know if you guys remember it called Final Score, a very good action, very another lean B movie action uh, film that I highly recommend as well. It came out in two thousand and eighteen. It's called Final Score. Take a look at it. I think you'll really like it. He also did a I film like with Robert Death. Yes, yes, very. But it's it's in a soccer field instead of a hockey rink. Yeah, I agree. Uh, check it out. He's a he's a very good filmmaker, very up and coming filmmaker. Um, also, a couple a uh, couple more uh, uh, honorable mentions. Uh, Brad Pitt in Bullet Train, honorable mention, enjoyable for sure. It's like Deadpool meets John Wick in that respect. If you're if you're a fan, um, another film that I highly recommend and is a gem that a lot not a lot of people saw but you can watch it on paramount plus right now smile smile is great if you haven't seen it yet uh it went very much radar this is terrifying it's fun the story is incredibly good well done if you haven't seen smile you need to did you see it yeah i loved it i love smile i thought it was yeah, it's so scary. Yeah. I, you know, inevitably, I mean, the plot is very similar to It Follows. There's even a line of dialogue where someone says, you never know who has it, and you never know Correct. who Correct. And it just, it sounds ver- ver- stolen verbatim from It Follows, but, you know, it's fine. Um, it beautifully directed, so terrifying. Some of the scariest scenes of the year. Yeah, it, it definitely deserves its sleeper status, and it did so well, so I'm, I'm really happy for them. It's a... I, I can't say I expect it to be that good from the trailer, but it's it's really, really scary. Seriously. It's really scary. It was go- what's interesting is that it came out the week of or the week after Barbarian. And Barbarian is another one of those uh, uh, hidden gems, I thought, too. I thought Great. Barbarian was very Great good. Movie. Yeah. Great yeah. movie as well. Um, and last but not least on my best of, or not best of, but my honorable mentions list, if you have not seen it, do it. It's still the holiday season. If you have not seen Violent Night, do so immediately. Uh, Violent Night is tremendous. David Harbour as Santa Claus is, is something to behold. And the story is incredibly cynical, but also has its heart in the right place, which is very strange. Um, so if you are still in the holiday mood, check out Violent Night. Is it, it is extremely cynical, extremely violent, but it is also Ironically, a f- a ver- it's very much a family movie. 
And I say that in respect of the of the theme of the film, but Violent Night, just for all <clears throat> intents and purposes, is an adult kids movie. If you under if you if you catch my drift, it's an adult kids movie. Okay, that's all you need to know. Uh, I highly recommend it. If you know if you know the director Tommy Ricola, he's the guy who did Dead Snow, Dead Snow Two, and he did the Hansel and Gretel movie with Jeremy Renner. That's the kind of that's the kind of. Uh, um, uh, uh, a film that this is. It has that very strange kind of weird tone to it, but it totally works for me. So check out Violent Night. I think you'll really enjoy it for sure. Anyway, Professor Barry, uh, anything you'd like to plug before we get out of here other than your uh, your podcast with your wife? Yes, now as you mentioned. So I married a film critic, which is on Spotify and Apple. No, it's a show that my wife and I do. We we bust out new episodes once a week, and we love it. It's just movies that we're watching. We have conversations about it, and sometimes we completely disagree with each other. So that's always fun. Um, other than that, no, I've I've got articles uh, coming out on Maui Time, uh, MauiTimes.com rather. Um, also in print, and I also have articles coming out on HollywoodandToto.com. Um, yeah, no, I, I keep busy, and and I love movies just as much as you guys do. I'm glad you you all had good uh, experiences this year except for the one time greg uh where you recommended a movie that aaron uh, failed to get through three times three times <laughs> <laughs> wait was it R- kind of you couldn't get through rrr three times no rrr i tried to watch once couldn't do it fablemans i tried three times i well, because i tried to give spielberg you know i love you should give him the benefit of the doubt mm-hmm. and it was a very good movie i enjoyed it but uh yeah Aaron, what about you? Anything happening in your neck of the woods? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, no. You know me, I watch everything. So yeah. if I watch it, I write about it and I post it. Facebook, Instagram, Nerdwatch page. You're also you your 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 reviews are also on a great uh on a great movie site called Letterbox, which I highly recommend. That's yeah. a letterbox with a D. Yes. Uh, so check yeah. it out. Letterboxd is a fantastic way. If you like to, if you, if you like to rate films and and ha, you know write about them, uh, write about them or socialize with people of like mind, check out Letterboxd. It's a great site for that. Um, Aaron puts his uh, reviews up there as well. Uh, very good stuff. And you can also find reviews at uh, highfilmcriticsociety.org. Highfilmcriticsociety.org. Uh, from uh, our 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 good reviewers that are not here tonight, like uh, Chad and ever and Jason, David and young Choi. And uh, who am I missing? Uh, Terry Hunter, Gary Coble, Sharon, I big no Yeah. Yes. Um, but just know that this, once again, what you're seeing on screen or listening to right now, this is the elite. Okay. This right here, me, Ron, Greg, Barry, the elite. All right. That's all you need to know. Don't tell any of the other reviewers at all. If you listen to this, don't tell them. But we're the elite. Um, anyway, um, uh, as for me, um, some uh, there may be some changes on the horizon um, uh, coming up next year um, in 2023 regarding um, Hawaii Film Critics Society um, and uh, what we may be doing with it moving forward. As far as this, we do this very rarely. This may this may or may not happen more often. We're still we're still trying to figure this out, as it were. But 2023 may be a new year of uh, of new adventures. So be prepared uh, for that. So uh, that'll be uh, that'll be coming up in the near future as well. Uh, but yes, uh, 2022. If you haven't seen these films, do yourself a favor. Sit down if you've got some time in the new year. Catch up on some fun new films. Uh, if- if you, uh, our recommendations for these films will be coming out January 13th, uh, then you can see them. Um, where can we find them? Not just on Hawaii, uh, highphonecriticsociety.org. Uh, you'll be publishing them as well, correct, Professor Barry? That's correct. Yeah, they should hopefully be everywhere. But uh, you have the Facebook page, of course, which is it's the Hawaii Film, Hawaii Film Critics Society. That's primarily where I put them out. And, of course, uh, our wonderful publicists and reps tend to spread the news as far and wide as they can. So, yeah, we'll, we'll have that out very soon. Well, I do want to send once again, every single year I do this, but I will do it yet again. I want to send a big thank you and a uh, 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 a lot of respect to the man who started this whole thing, Professor Barry Worst. He is not only the founder, he is the president. He is the man who has put this uh, whole Hawaii Film Critics Society together. Without him, this would not be possible. And um, without him, wouldn't have gotten us. So... 
Um, consider yourselves lucky. Um, but uh, yeah, so Professor Barry, um, uh, getting people of like mind together and to and to share their love of not just film, but also share that love in a form that is becoming more and more obsolete. And that is uh, the love of writing. Uh, so uh, that I tell you what, that's a. Uh, that is, uh, I've, I'm starting to get my love back of writing because I'm starting to do Substack. I'm not writing, but but reading as reading writers. So it's uh, that's a that's a great way as well. But uh, yeah, so thank you to Professor Barry for uh, all that he's yeah. uh, all that he's done and put together uh, for us guys in the Hawaii Film Critics Society. And he's kept and keeping us uh, alive and keeping the voice of the islands alive and telling everybody in Hollywood that we are relevant. And that our voice here in the middle of Pacific uh, not often gets heard, but we are getting more and more heard every year because of uh, the hard work of the Hawaii Film Critics Society. So uh, that'll be the last nice thing I say about Barry for the rest of 2022. And uh, we'll see you next year. Uh, no, <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, anyway, we are out of time, boys and girls. Have a wonderful, wonderful uh, holiday uh, weekend. I hope your Christmases were good. We got uh, we're, we're we're recording this. We're right before uh, New Year's, and uh, once again, uh, go out, watch a film. If you're not, stay home, watch some great movies. I mean, we didn't even mention like the sequel to Knives Out is out now. Uh, Glass Onion that literally just released just a couple of days ago. Uh, we got the screener. Two weeks after we got, I don't know if anybody else did, but I got screen like two weeks after I got that big box from them and it's already on Netflix. I'm like, well, there's no point in that anyway. But anyway, people, uh, I was like, there's no point. What the heck? Anyway, people have a, uh, a lovely uh, uh, 2020, the rest of your 2022 and looking forward to our 2023. So for Professor Barry, for myself or for Aaron and for myself, Greg, we are the Hawaii Film Critics Society. We will see you in the new year of 2023, and we'll tell you what you need to see. So until next time, uh, peace out, much love, and always watch movies. Aloha to all. Aloha. Thank you. Bye.